Sam Hitchcock Tilton. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thanks to Aaron and Harriet for having me. I'm a horticulture instructor at Lakeshore Technical College uh, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Uh, I have a background in vegetable growing. Uh, I got a master's degree in horticulture at Michigan State, uh, where I studied precision weed control tools. And uh, then I worked for Cult Crest, a uh, German company, in my opinion, world leader in uh, weeding tools. And I went all over Europe and the U.S., both in graduate school and working for Cult Crest, visiting farmers um, and doing research. I am in, by no means an expert, but I've talked to a lot of people who are and a lot of experienced growers. So I'm going to show, uh, share some things with you today. Uh, I erred on the side of packing more in than less. So, uh, so let these things uh, hit you and absorb what you want. And uh, whenever we're done here with the session, um, I brought a row unit over there, and I'll just go stand there if people want to talk about or look at tools. Okay? All right. Um, let's look at the big picture. At least for people like me, it's real easy to get uh, excited about pieces of shiny metal. Um, but much more important than pieces of shiny metal are management practices that I would think as organic farmers, we know that a simple decision in the winter can save a lot more money than buying a $40,000 machine. So while I'm going to talk about today mostly the things up top in terms of what machinery can do, um, in my opinion, uh, these things kind of lower down on this weeding pyramid, uh, as I would look at it, uh, can be even a lot more important. So for example, uh, for any of these tools to work, we need to have a size difference between the weed and our crop, either in top growth or a size difference in weed and crop and root growth in how, how well they're anchored to the ground. Okay, how do we get that size difference? I would think seeing things like uh, soil health, um, like having uh, uh, good seedbed preparation, having the proper layout um, so that we have enough room for our tools to work. These are all things that um, you can think about in the winter and you know have these thousand dollar ideas sitting there at your kitchen table instead of coming to uh, an equipment salesman to spend a bunch of money. So just to see things in context, okay? Um, okay. Um, before we even pull out a fancy tool, it's important to think about uh, planters. Uh, in my work with Cult Crest, we would have a lot of farmers call us up uh, wanting to get uh, a weeding machine. And we would start talking to them about their planter, and they would say, no, 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 I want a weeding machine. And we would say, no, 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 we want your weeding machine to work. Okay? So, for example, here's a little quiz for you. I'm an instructor now, so I've got to give a quiz. Okay? Uh, let's say your planter is planting six rows at a time, and you've got a cultivator that cultivates six rows at a time. Are you set up for success? Yes, Mr. Carrot says yes, okay? Let's say you've got an eight-row planter uh, and your cultivator is six-row. Are you set up for success? No, you're not. You might be able to do something, but in terms of precision weed control, uh, you, you're not going to get very far. Uh, what if you've got a 12-row planter and a six-row cultivator? What do you think? Well, Mr. Carrot says yes, but Mr. Exclamation Point says no, which is to say you can get something done, um, but you really need to worry about your overlaps then. Uh, which you can do, but in terms of uh, as you spend money on these precision tools, you really want to get your uh, money's worth out of them. And, uh, and so while you can do it in terms of the absolute precision, you're not going to get there. Okay? And what about uh, six planter rows and a 12-row cultivator? No. No. That's not going to work. So, again, um, just like we looked at our, at our big uh, pyramid of, of uh, weeding techniques, as I would call it, um, we need to look at the big picture of mating our planter with our cultivator. Okay. Let's talk about planter guidance. Uh, when you have GPS on a tractor, uh, what is being controlled? What, 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 what part of your machinery is exactly on that AB line? The rear axle of that tractor. Okay. So if farmers come to me and say, oh, don't worry about my, cul my cultivating. I've got GPS I'll, I'll use on my pull type planter. No, no, no. Okay, sure, again, you'll get something done. But if we're going to sell you a machine that, that can get you know, within an inch of the crop roll, um, that's not going to get you within an inch. So things to think about is, where is your GPS? Is it on your tractor or is it on your implement? So you can think when this tractor turns with a pull-type planter, uh, that, that thing might swing widely or, say, up and down on the side of a side hill, even, say, 4% slope. Um, you can start to have problems, okay? Um, so here, for uh, example, we've got a um, – sorry, I'm just pointing at this screen all the time. I'm, I'm shortchanging these people. Um, we've got a GPS on the back of the planter uh, as well, so that I'm sure the tractor's on an AB line, but now this person knows absolutely that those seeds are right where they think they are, okay? Um, so we talked about planting, and now we'll, we'll get into cultivation tools, and we'll kind of work our way through a sequence if we can. Um, first thing I would think about is blind cultivation. Um, we need to get that size difference. 
Um, a lot of people will call me up and say, hey, I've got this cultivator and I'm just really not getting the weed control I need. Blind cultivation, I would say, is an absolute must in organics in terms of starting out with that size difference. Okay? Um, and I would think of a pre-emergent um, blind cultivation a as really starting that out. So what you want to have is later when you come through with your row crop cultivator, that's just maintaining the size difference that you already started. Okay? So here we can see we've got our corn seeds or our crop seeds, and they're usually generally bigger than our weed seeds, right? They've got more energy reserves, so we can plant them deeper, and they're still going to emerge. Um, for blind cultivation, we want to be, say, at least an inch and a half, inch and three quarters deep um, so that we can come on top before our crop has emerged um, and use that rotary hole, use that tine weeder to disturb those white thread weeds so that by the time our crop breaks the soil, they're already ahead of any weeds. Okay, let's talk about mounting. Um, this is a way I think about the tools that at least has helped me understand how all these systems work. There's a lot of attachments going on here, and I want to think about all of them. The first thing I think about uh, is how my cultivator attaches to the tractor, okay? Now, you better believe that uh, when you go to uh, adjust your cultivator, you're going to be out there with your wrench changing every little thing. Okay? If you want to do a good job, you got to do that. But as much as we can, we want to uh, minimize that. And one thing that I see all over Europe but don't see nearly enough of in the U.S. is hydraulic top links, okay? One, this just makes uh, uh, very much easier to hook up to implements or say when you need to lift them out of the ground for going over a ditch, etc. Um, but when you want to make um, a uniform adjustment to all of your tools, uh, start out by playing with your hydraulic top link, and you'll just very, uh, very slowly change the angle of that tool into the ground. And it doesn't always work at all, and that's when you get out there with your wrench. But if you can do that and save adjusting, say, 16 rows, that's a good tool to have in your tool belt. Another thing I see a lot of in Europe um, are hydraulic cylinders on the lower sway bars, Okay. Um, this is an idea, especially if you have um, slopes. Um, let's say you're going, um, you're going on the side of a slope and your planter, even on a three-point hitch, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hang down just a little bit. And that gives you the option to really dial things in. Um, so again, I'd say a big theme of my talk here is options. It can get really overwhelming, all the different um, tools and possibilities there are. Um, but I think as organic growers, because we have a management-heavy approach, um, we need to have as many tools in the toolbox as possible to fit those conditions. So again, some of these will work for you, some of them won't, now you know. Um, so let's get started here on uh, the old journey of cultivation, one that I've been on for many, many years. Um, here's, a, here's a cultivator, and this is something we might get out of a fence roll, or I, I don't know if many of you have something like this or not. The first thing I think about is shields. What are crop shields for? Okay, sure. To put a finer point on it, I would say the real use of crop shields is to moderate the amount of soil we're throwing in the row, okay? It's not so much that we're worried about our crop getting clipped by, um, by cultivator shovels or things like that. If you're using crop shields, what you want to do, uh, and I want to give my thanks to Gary McDonald here, who, who has a lot of good things to say about adjusting old cultivators, um, but what you want to do is set that shield um, so that you're throwing in enough soil to bury all of your weeds, um, but not enough soil to bury your crop. And now, can we do that if our weeds and crop are the same size? No, we got to start with that size difference first. And when we have that size difference, we can bury those weeds um, just by using simple sweeps and, um, and uh, row guard. Now, what I also see here um, is, a, is a coulter for steering. Okay, here you can see it a lot more clearly up in front. These can be great on uh, older cultivators, especially if we don't have any type of guidance. Um, they're going to sink in the ground, say, four inches or so, and they're going to act as rudders. Um, to keep our cultivator locked in the ground and grow, going straight. Question for you. Let's say I'm using a machine like this. Uh, what do I want my, my sway bars, my lower three-point links? Do I want them tight as can be or, or with a little play? And why is that? Yeah, exactly. So, so let's say I'm on a you know, John Deere 4020 or something. I know I'm not going to hit that perfect AB line. I'm going to be a little off here and there. I want to give my cultivator room to steer itself so that if I go a little bit off, the cultivator's not jumping with me, okay? And a good tip that, that Gary McDonald had here, um, you can see how his coulter's towed in just a little bit, okay? And the idea there is that with both coulter's towed in, it's going to want to pull straight. They'll kind of balance each other out and pull you to the center. So, again, there's all sort of, sorts of little tips and tricks um, to really dial in the, the accuracy of what we're doing. And we answered how tight nine sway bars although not in such a poetical way. Okay, 
Here's something else that's big coming out of Europe that I, I think a lot of you all have seen, and if you haven't, just come see me over there afterwards, okay? Um, so back in the day, we had our sweeps rigidly mounted to our toolbars, right? And what's the problem with that? Rocks. We hit stones, boom, we break them. We want rigidity built in, just like in our lives, right? So all of a sudden, out of uh, Denmark, like, uh, like a bolt of lightning from the sky, came these Danish s -tines. And what did we like about those Danish s -tines? They flexed with rocks. They didn't break. At the same time, they vibrated, vibro shank, right? They vibrated through the soil, and they would dislodge weeds from, um, uh, from the soil as they went through, okay? Now, what's the problem with that? Uh, that can be a great tool on a cultivator. Notice the air quotes, okay? On a cultivator that's meant for incorporating herbicides. Now, a lot of cultivators built since, I don't know, the 70s, they call them cultivators. That's not what they are. They're not meant to kill weeds or get close to the row. They're meant to incorporate herbicides, okay? And... Um, these things can bounce a lot, around a lot in the soil. Okay. Uh, and that's what they're meant to do. So you can imagine this is a full spring. I'm not going to get great accuracy, which is great for stones. Um, but when we want to get really close to a crop, you can see this is what they call a vibro shank. Okay? And it's half spring, half straight shank. Two things. One, it gives you a little flexibility when you hit rocks so you're not breaking things. But two, it gives you good precision. Okay? If you look at my nice uh, German... Um, um, diagram here, you can see they're talking about capillary soil water. So the s tines go too deep and can break a lot of capillary action um, if things get dry, whereas these vibro shanks can maintain a nice shallow depth. Okay? And also you can see that each one can be individually adjusted uh, up and down. So our s tines we can't adjust the level between um, s tines right? They just mount on all of the, on the bars, whereas here let's say we want a, uh, a sweep uh, lower or deeper near the row, we can do that. Um, so, for example, here you can see the vibro shank or the spring, and you can see the rigid shank mounted on it with the bolt that you can loosen and tighten to bring it up and down. Uh, other thing I want to say is that a lot of what we're seeing in terms of precision uh, are knives, or I would call them knives. I wouldn't call them shovels, okay? So, for example, um, this would be a, a more European-type sweep, okay? And the angle on it is much lower so that I have the option of not throwing a lot of soil, okay? This is a ridging element. I can loosen this bolt here and lift it up and down or take it off. So let's say I'm going my first cultivation. Um, I want to be careful not to bury my young crop with soil. I'll pull this ridging element off, and I have the option of going very shallowly, not bringing up new weed seeds, and not throwing a lot of soil, okay? Let's say uh, my crop's getting bigger. Maybe it's the final cultivation. I want to hill up some soil. I'll put one of these on the other side, come through, I can raise it and lower it on the shank to really dial in the amount of soil I'm throwing. And again, you can see from this example, at Agritechnica two years ago, but I missed Brian, that was too bad, um, we see all the different kind of shanks that are possible. And again, come see over there if you want to see a few different ones. Okay, the final frontier, as Captain Picard would say. No Star Trek fans, all right, tough crowd. Um, so, these are finger weeders, okay? Um, uh, but I want you to notice something first, which is what's running ahead is not a sweep. It's a knife. It's an L blade. Okay, this side is close to the crop, and it's got a blade running underneath. And you can see the literally razor straight line that it's cutting. Okay, sweeps often work by throwing soil into the roll. This is more of a system. The knives get as close to the roll as possible. Okay, then these are finger weeders. Um, these reach literally into the roll, depending on your crop size. Okay, you, know, you can adjust them further uh, apart or in, depending on how big your crop is, okay? And uh, depending on your conditions, you can get um, different colors, okay, which would be different hardnesses, depending on uh, uh, soft, sandy soil or a hard clay soil. And sometimes, depending on your crop, you can get different sizes, although for a lot of corn and soy growers, uh, we recommend a single size. And again, you can see them literally reaching into the row. Um, and there's all sorts of adjustments you can make that you guys spent years researching. If you want to talk about that with me, let me know. But again, you can really dial in these tools to fit your condition. And here's an example from the research plot. So you can see they're not burying weeds. Those fingers are literally poking into the roll. This is on carrots, a much more fragile crop than any corn and soy. But you can see how they're fracturing just, say, the top half inch of soil uh, and breaking the capillarity there. So that if we have weeds that are shallowly rooted, they'll be uprooted or cut off from their water supply, um, whereas our deeper rooted crop is going to be rooted below that fracture level. 
Okay, let's start putting things together. Here's a 16-roll collivator. I'm going to call this a collivator, okay, wink, wink, um, from over in Michigan. They were using this on corn. And they got a bunch of uh, finger weeders to retrofit on. Um, you'll notice that the finger weeders are mounted on arms, and I wish I could have brought one for you, that have springs, okay? Um, Joe was talking about wanting to maintain consistent depth into the ground, and with almost everything in our agriculture, we want a certain amount of uniformity. Um, so when you use finger weeders, um, people uh, will mount them rigidly. Uh, they need that spring. These are about $1,000 per row, okay? And can solve some problems and make others. Here's a full European cultivation setup, okay? We see um, the same size nut all over for adjusting things, the vibro shanks. We can adjust each sweep to a different level. Um, there's a spring for adjusting down pressure, so if we have hard soils or it's running in a tire trap, an easy crank, each crank around is a quarter inch. We can make precise adjustments without pulling out our measuring tape, and shallow sweeps that don't throw a lot of soil. A setup like this for a six-row cultivator would be about $7,000. But again, you're spending that money, you want to be able to steer it. Um, here's a Steckity cultivator, and it's got RTK on the cultivator itself, and it's got um, uh, rudders behind it that are controlled by the GPS to keep it right on. And again, we want loose sway bars to let our cultivator do the steering. So here's uh, where things are put together. Uh, here's a camera on this 16-row machine, and here's a slide hitch. So they bought a $40,000 uh, piece of machinery uh, to attach to their cultivator, uh, so the camera reads the roll, which uh, I would say is even more um, accurate than GPS. GPS is telling you where things should be. This camera is telling you where things are. Okay? Uh, here's over at Michigan. I don't know how big the video is. This is a about 30 You can see how, how uh, shallowly the sweeps are set and how the finger readers are reaching right into the roll. Okay. Uh, excuse me? Sure, see me afterwards. I just don't show those. Uh, so the other thing I saw in Europe is uh, they, you know, of course we need to be flexible in what we're doing, um, but they have a very definite progression of the type of tools they use and when they use them. And when they need to deviate, they do, but there's accepted understandings of what generally works. Uh, if they can, they start with a stale seed bed um, so that they get as many weeds germinating just before they plant that they can terminate. Uh, tillage for that would be as shallow as possible to not bring up new seeds a pre-emergence flex tine or rotary hole, and then a post-emergence flex tine or rotary hole maybe two or three times for a few weeks until the crop is big enough to run a, a cultivator through. The first cultivation would be uh, with knives only so that they can get in there as early as possible. Um, then they'd run with finger weeders uh, and the cultivator, and later for their last kind of lay-by cultivation before canopy closure, they do some hilling to kill uh, anything right in the row. Now this uh, smiling Russian lady reminds me of why we're here, which is that um, there's all sorts of uh, technology, and it's easy to get lost in the weeds of all the options here. But at the end of the day, we're all here to grow good food. Um, there's a lot of resources if you want to learn more about these machines. That's my email address. Um, I love talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, if you want me to come out and calibrate a machine, set something up, look at what you're doing, I enjoy doing that. Um, at the Moses Conference this year, uh, me and some others are, are teaching an organic university on Thursday that's just uh, mechanical weeding. Or sorry, just, just weed control for row crops. So that would be a great thing. And last is a Midwest Mechanical Weed Control. <laughs>